Anyway, we greatly desire to get down there. Um, as he was saying, one of the things that we really noticed is the people down there, they, they crave the truth. When we would bring the truth to them um, and pass out tracts and different things, it, they would actually come back and find us and ask us for more. Hey, do you have any different ones? Can we have some more of those? It, it really just pressed upon us how big the need is there. And what the video didn't say is we went down for our survey trip with a missionary, a veteran missionary. He grew up there his whole life as a missionary son, came to the States, and then the Lord called him to go back. So he went to Bible college and went back down there. And uh, he's been there, him and his wife, for many years now. Anyways, they they said after the end of the three weeks, had them pray on it, asked them if they wouldn't mind taking us in. Uh, and helping us get through the first year to get the language, the culture, um, just the barriers that we're going to naturally meet down there. And uh, Lord, Lord gave them peace about that. So it's a huge blessing for us to go down and start with a veteran missionary and, and help us get through that. And then our desire, our call, I should say, where the Lord wants us to go is to the West Coast, like the video said, to Guayabitos, to that group, um, I would ask if you could remember when you pray for us, uh, also pray for the church in Guayabitos. Uh, just if you can't remember the name, that's okay. They they don't have a called leader right now, a pastor. They had two men that were running the church. They weren't called and they knew it, but they were guiding the church. The one ended up dying from terminal cancer about three months after we met him. That was last year. And then the other one was a national, and just three weeks ago we found out that he died in a car accident. Uh, the church just keeps going through turmoil. And it's rough to see with these people, too. They just they crave the leadership and the word, and and they they want to do right, and they want to grow. And um, that is, that is why the Lord really put them on our hearts continually once we came back. So there's a 22-year-old kid right now. I say kid. <laughs> he has stepped up and he wants to lead the church in lieu of somebody getting there. <laughs> so we're praying for fast uh, deputation and we can get down there and get going. Um, to give you a little bit of lighter things, something that'll kind of make you laugh, some things about Mexico maybe. Uh, we, we said this at lunchtime. When we, were, we went to lunch after Sunday morning church, just one of the things that we'll have to get used to anyway, and we were telling them about a Mexican restaurant up where we live that had to close down for a few years because they were recycling their chips and dip. And... <laughs> For all you double dippers, <laughs> anti-double dippers, um, and as we were telling this, telling them this in disgust, they had this very sober look, and they're like, "Well, where do you think they learn it?" <laughs> as we're sitting at the table, we're like, "We never thought about that." <laughs> So we laughed about it and everything, and then we had evening service, and after evening service, we went back up, out to eat. Lo and behold, it was tacos. Imagine that in Mexico. And there's this green salsa that is it's amazing down there. Pretty much they all make it, and my wife loves it. So she asked if she could get some more, and the lady said, okay. And she went a couple tables away, and she was talking to the people, and she grabbed their green sauce and brought it over to us and put it in front of my wife. And there's chip floaties and different <laughs> stuff in there. <laughs> All the uh, anti-double dippers in here, come down and visit. <laughs> it's um, there. There's a lot of great things we're gonna get used to. That's just one of the funnier things. It eventually becomes a uh, ah, whatever. The Lord, the Lord. That's why you ask the Lord to bless your food, right? Amen. You tell them thank you, and you say, Lord, please bless this to our bodies and nourish us, and don't let us get sick from somebody else's. <laughs> yeah, 
build our immune system of anything. <laughs> anyway, some of the great things you'll hear from missionaries. There's there's some better ones out there I've heard. <laughs> and so when we came back, my wife was already kind of telling me, she, the Lord has always told both of us at the same time. I was telling this gentleman this morning when we got the call, we were in a missions conference and we were on our way home after like the third night. And she asked me how what I thought of it. And then she's like, you feel like the Lord's speaking to your heart? And I'm like, maybe. Because by this time, he was already putting it on my heart. And I was going, no way, this isn't, this is not me. I would never even want to go to Mexico. Why would I even think about this? And I said, is he talking to you? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, what do you, what do you think he's saying? And she said, well, you're not going to like that. And I said, well, tell me anyway. And she said, well, I think he wants us to be missionaries. And inside I was kind of like, oh. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, where to? And I'm like screaming, don't say Mexico. Because <laughs> if she said Mexico, it was going to be real by that point. And when we got married, uh, we were looking at honeymoon sites, and she wanted to go to Mexico. And I said, I will never, ever go to Mexico. No desire. We can go to Hawaii, Fiji, Africa. <laughs> We're not going to Mexico, though. So then I said, well, where do you think he wants us to go to? And she said, well, you're really not going to like that. <laughs> and she, I said, well, let me know. And she said Mexico. And I had a hard time with it in the beginning, like I said in the video. But once I really learned the faith and obedience towards the Lord, uh, we have had a great desire to be down there and, and get going on the work. I, I desire to be in Mexico now. <laughs> Lord can change your desires. And when we came back, I started praying, you know, Lord, what do you, what do you want us to do? Um, where do you want us to be? We, we knew Mexico. And the, the thing that the Lord keep bringing, bring, bringing up to my attention was Guayabitos. And that's where my wife was saying about a month ago prior, that's what I feel like he wants us to do. And I told her, shh. <laughs> but he's always put it on both of our hearts at the same time. And anyways, go, back, go to Matthew chapter 9, and I'll show you. This is something I started reading after a few weeks that is just in my normal everyday reading, going through the chapter, and um, he brought this to my attention, and it it spoke um, a million words, <laughs> and just a short few verses here. In Matthew chapter 9, starting at verse 35, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted, and were scattered abroad, as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Let's pray, and then we'll get into it. Father, we do come to you and we thank you, Lord, for your word again tonight. And I do pray that you would work, Lord. You would move on hearts. You would uh, use me, Lord. And uh, you would bless this church greatly, Lord. And uh, their desire to uh, just follow your will. And we uh, pray it all in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. So... When I started reading this, and he was moved with compassion on them because they were fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd, it just it stabbed me about Guayabitos. And the people of Mexico, like the video was saying, I hate to, to reiterate it, but uh, they really don't have a hope down there. There's so much oppression on the people. The government is corrupt, and they, they hold them down. There is rich and there is the, everybody else way down here there's barely any middle class in between and uh <clears throat> the, not only is it the government and there's there's poverty and well there's the drug wars 
and there's the extortion through the cartels and everything. Um, and then you look at, well, what do you go to usually? What do people find in those times of desire, those times of oppression is they look to the Lord. They have Catholicism. If anybody ever, if you know Catholicism, it's it's dead. Your, your pastor grew up in it. He knows. And like I said, that lady, she's just holding the statue's hand, just desiring to have fellowship with the Lord and not knowing how because of the church. It, it really drew us to go down there and be that light, as you talked about. They need... They need hope. So when you do show them the truth and you lay it out in front of them, they get excited. They get happy. They, they want it and they desire to grow in it. It's that eternal security that they've never seen before because of the oppression down there. A lot of people, they're actually turning to atheism because, well, there can't be a God. Look at everything that's going on and God never does anything. And so I was reading this, and it just it really moved me, and it really pricked my heart. And it just gave us even more of a desire to go down there, to labor, to, to win, to plant, to train nationals, to get more people out. And uh, that's, that's really what we want to do. And you come to verse 37 where he says, He saith unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous. It is, but the laborers are few. And I started just, man, Lord, why are the laborers so few? It's not just Mexico. I hear other, um, there's some missionaries where they're in a hard land where the people are stone hard rocks and it, it takes years to get through to people. But then you have lands where people are desiring it and they're, they're, they're people getting saved nonstop and growing. And they say there's so much of a need. Come, we need more missionaries. And why, Lord? Why are there so few laborers? And then, you know, I, I broke it down even more and I started thinking about America. Look where America's at today. We need laborers in America. Well, then you got to break it down even farther. And you look into the churches um, of America. And let's leave it with the Bible-believing churches that know the truth. They have the truth. And they get it preached to them nonstop, and it it begs the question of where are the laborers? Um, I started thinking about this and just kind of wondering what's what's going on. And I don't know this church well enough, so I'm not going to say it's this church at all. Uh, but this is something that we should all take a personal application to, like we were talking about this morning. Um, America, you know what we breed in America today. A me attitude. Me, 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 me. Me first. What is the what is the financial uh, guy I always say? What is his name? Dave, Dave Ramsey, is that his name? Pay you first. You know, me comes first. Um, well, we know that not to be true. The Lord comes first. You always pay the Lord first. But that is the attitude within America. And that's why nobody wants to labor for the Lord. There's too much of me going on and there's many things that could really be said about this and I, I was just praying over this for a long while there and asking the Lord to show me some things and there's a lot that can be said but I got a few things that I really want to show tonight go to Luke chapter 8 this is a uh, pretty popular passage it's the parable of the sower who goes out to sow seed and <clears throat> there are some great things within this passage that I'm going to really key in on tonight that I pray the Lord speaks to your heart like He did with mine. Starting in verse 4, Luke chapter 8 and verse 4. And, much people were, and when much people were gathered together and were come to Him out of every city, He spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow a seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. And it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock. Excuse me. And as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit in a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. 
And his disciples asked him, saying, hmm, what might this parable be? <laughs> and he, uh, so he tells them, you need to understand this. In verse 11, he says, now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The guy's throwing out seed. This is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and have no, and these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, they go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. Um, in here you have four different grounds where the, sow is, or the, the seed is getting sowed in, right? And it's in relation to sowing that word of God right here, this word of God. Who in here has a garden? Plant seeds. Okay, there's a few, amen? Usually in western Washington, you have a lot. You got a garden. Don't be ashamed. <laughs> even, even a Marine can have a garden. Anyway, we want the best kind of ground for our seed, right? Because we know what it needs. And unfortunately, you don't always get the best ground. My father-in-law... His 10 acres is butted up next to a rock quarry. You know what he gets every time you put a shovel in the ground? Boulders, rocks. It, it is so rocky up there. He has boulders like lining his driveway he just got from his own place. <laughs> you know, nice boulders that you would go out and buy to make, make it nice. He just has them there. <laughs> Sometimes we just don't always get the best ground. And... The ground here, it, it shows us um, here in verse, where is it, verse 15, it says, But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart. So I want you to know already up front, this, these types of ground, it's, it's a heart. It's somebody's heart. And uh, you're going to have one of these hearts here tonight as we go through here. In verse 12, those by the wayside... So here's the first ground. Uh, break it down real simple. You have the way. Uh, if I need to go over there, that's the way right here. It's the path. That is the way side. It's off to the side. And you can see it on any road you drive down. It's the side of the road. Amen. And especially when you kind of get, a, um, it's even around in town, but you get out of town on some backcountry roads. The wayside. It's where everybody throws their trash out, right? It doesn't ever get taken care of normally. Uh, it just collects junk and it's fine with it. And that's what this wayside heart is. It's the neglected heart. It's, it's, uh, it's next to the pathway. It, it likes to hoard all the junk from the world and it very rarely gets cleaned up. Amen? This is the heart that neglects to... Get clean and stay clean. The word of God, it'll get sown. And look what happens here in verse 12. The wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their heart, lest they should believe and be saved. Uh, it's easy for the devil to take the word of God out of this heart. Yeah, that's right. Because you have too much of the world, too much junk. You're not, you don't care enough about the word of God. So it's pretty easy. The devil's smart. And he's witty, and he's got a lot of tools that he uses. Right. And if you're kind of hanging out on the backside, and you're kind of coming to church and kind of hearing the Word of God, but you're not thrusting in like this morning's message and giving yourself to God, letting Him have dominion over you, the devil is going to go, oh, that's easy picking. I'm going to take that one. Oh, on there's now. another one. He has on no now. problem taking that Word away from that heart. He'll take it with ease. And then you have verse 13, they on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy and these have no root which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away. And you can also see it in verse 6 there, uh, as soon as it was sprung up it withered away because it lacked moisture. 
uh, you sow seed in this ground and it, it can't get down. So what do the roots do? They go out and it has no depth. It has nothing to really ground itself in. Right. And it'll, you'll receive the word. You'll get it. You'll understand it. You'll have joy about it even. But when persecution comes along, you have no depth. No depth. You have no roots in the Lord, in the Bible, in church. <clears throat> it's hard to bear any kind of persecution. But you bear persecution without having roots. That's unbearable. That's right. That's right. Amen. It really is. You won't have any moisture to keep yourself um, from getting withered away from the temptation, the heat of temptation. You got to come to this for a drink every day. Come on now. Amen. Right. This has the true waters that we need. That's the rocky ground. And then you have the thorns, and personally, this is my favorite to preach on. I actually fell into this category for a while. And that which fell among the thorns are they, which when they have heard, they go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. Hey, they hear it, they understand it, and they, they could even get joyous over it. You can even get saved, but... Even before you get saved, the cares of the world will come in and choke. Who has blackberry briars on their property? Probably not many because we're in town, but there are actually quite a few. What do blackberry briars do, man? They grow and they don't stop unless you dig them out by the root. My father-in-law, this is how bad it is. I'll talk about his place again. <laughs> a lot of great illustrations at his place. He... uh. He had a lot of old old cars that would sit, because he has 10 acres, so he'd just kind of park a car when it would die, and he figured, well, I'll get to it eventually. And <laughs> he's a guy. And was, yeah, he's a guy, right? We all have projects. How many wives could say, yeah? <laughs> I didn't have to say it, and you're already saying amen. You know what I'm talking about. We have plenty of projects we don't finish. But the Blackberry Briars came in. And it had been a few few years at least, and uh, he decided, they were having a big family reunion and decided to have it at their place because they got a lot of properties. like, oh, I'm, I'll clear all this out, brush hog it, and we'll get it all cleaned up. So he started brush hogging. You know what he ran into? Cars. <laughs> <laughs> totally forgot they were there. Couldn't see them. They grew up over three cars and entangled them, and it completely covered them. And didn't even know they were there. Ran into them. <laughs> this is what thorns do. I have this stump with one tree uh, that's it's yay big coming out by this stump with these briars around it. And I've noticed over the years, because I just dump my clippings and stuff there, the briars have wrapped around it and are choking it, literally. This is what the cares of this world will do. Choke the word of God out of you. Amen. Today, we really are so busy in this life, right? Amen. We have so much to do. We have jobs to upkeep. We have kids to school, especially homeschooling kids. Uh, we have kids to raise and take care of, kids' sports. You have uh, automobiles that need maintenance. You have a house that needs maintenance. You have a wife that needs maintenance. <laughs> Say it like that. Now, we, hey, if you've been married for any amount of time, you know you have to spend time with your spouse. That's right. You have to. Amen. Um, it even happens to me. I neglect my wife. The time that she deserves because I get so busy. Preach <laughs> I'm preaching to myself right now. <laughs> we have kids on top of that that want to play with you. Amen. You need a relationship with your kids. That's right. you got to go to their sports. You have friends that you want to hang out with. You have family that you need to be with. You have, you have TV, my, my favorite TV shows on tonight. i got to watch it. I can't miss it. Even though in, today, I don't know, they can record probably 20 shows at once. I don't know because I haven't had a TV in a while. Um, <laughs> we have things to do. Yeah. Things, things, things. And by the time nighttime rolls around, you, 
you're you're exhausted and you don't pull this out like you should. You don't pray like you should. Maybe I'll get up in the morning, but well, I stayed up too late watching my shows till eleven o'clock. So now I'm gonna get up a little bit later, and I don't I don't have time for the Lord. I don't have time. There's too many things going on. The devil isn't gonna make it easy on you to serve the Lord if you want to. He's not. He's gonna keep pouring it on. I got a great example for you. The devil knows all of our sweet spots. Don't think that you can fool him. He knows your sweet spot just as the Lord does. He can read you. And you get into church. You hear the word of God. Amen. You get that seed. And the Lord speaks to your heart on some issues. And I'm betting everybody in here can say that's happened. Amen. And uh, whether it's either to get saved, amen for that lady who got saved this morning, hallelujah, that's, that's awesome. Amen. Um, it, maybe it's to read your Bible because you haven't been reading your Bible consistently or, or praying, talking with the Lord, having fellowship. Maybe it's uh, you need to grow in your spiritual Christian walk. You need to start walking instead of crawling. Uh, maybe it's that he wants you to labor for the church. Yes, amen, labor for the church because pastor can't do it all. I've seen it. There's uh, the church that needs to be taken care of. There's nursery, man, all the praise in the world for you nursery ladies. (laughs) You put me in there and you're going to see six kids duct taped on the wall by the time you come to pick your kids up. (laughs) That's why men aren't allowed in the nursery, amen. Uh, There's grounds that need to be upkept. There's maintenance. There's things that need to be done. There's there's uh, classes that need to be taught. Uh, you know what? Maybe, just maybe, the Lord is working on you to go into the ministry. Amen. Amen. Just maybe. This really does apply to all of us, whether you've been here for three months or you've been here for 20 years. Uh, the Lord will reach you at any point in time. And he'll speak to your heart on these issues. So the Lord starts speaking to your heart. You get that word in there. And you know what? You even have a little bit of a revival in your heart with you and the Lord. And you get excited and and you start making decisions of you're going to do something for the Lord. Amen? This even goes with salvation because I, uh, I went to church, opened the Bible as the video said, and I was like, this is the truth. I knew it from right there. The Lord spoke to my heart. I knew what to do as soon as that got done. Did I walk the aisle? No. (laughs) I was scared and embarrassed. But you know what I did when I went home? I went straight down to my knees in my apartment. I didn't do it at church, but right away. So the Lord even could speak to somebody about getting saved. But before they get home, the world could kick in. Anyways, the Lord speaks to you, you have decisions, you're excited, and uh, you have a little bit of a revival, and you're praying on it that night, and you go to bed, uh, you wake up, it's Monday morning. <laughs> I'm going to say the all-famous word that my wife loves to hear, bam, life, life hits you in the face, Monday morning. You, you go to work, and your boss doesn't know what's going on with you, especially with your spiritual walk. He doesn't know. He doesn't. He's probably not even saved, most likely, uh, with a few people that are out there that seems to be saved and, and walking. Anyways, he doesn't know, and uh, nobody else at your job knows. Your family probably doesn't even know. Um, and then all the things that I talked about in life that consumes us happens. And go go over to Exodus chapter four. I got a great example of this. The Lord showed me this one time. Exodus chapter 4, starting in verse 1 here. Got a few verses here. Come on now, preach. Come on. Oh, I better get going. So Israel, there's types in the Old Testament. Israel, the type of that believer, us, in the world, which is Egypt. And uh, Pharaoh would obviously be a picture of the devil. And uh, what happens at the end of chapter 3 there is Moses gets the people together. They have a revival because the Lord is going to take us out of Egypt. And everybody gets excited and they worship the Lord. And here comes verse uh, chapter 4, verse 1. And the Moses answered and said, 
but behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto me my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is... Oh, wait, where am I at? It's not Exodus chapter 4, Exodus chapter 5, sorry. At the end of chapter 4 is uh, what happens, as I said happened. You can see right at the end of verse 31, uh, bowed their heads in worship. And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. And they said, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert, and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with a sword. And the king of Egypt said unto Moses, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works, listen to this, get you unto your burdens. Get back to your burdens. You have a life to live. Are you crazy? You want to go serve the Lord? That's what the devil is going to do. Get back to your burdens. The devil is not going to let you leave the world easily. And he's going to use the world to keep you in it. And we can see it right here in verse 5. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. And Pharaoh commanded the same day, the taskmasters of the people and their officers saying, Ye shall no more give the people straw to make brick the, um, as heretofore, meaning they need to now, uh, don't, not only do they need to make the same amount, they got to go get the stub material for the bricks, which they used to not have to. And it says uh, in verse 9 here, Let their more work be laid upon the men. More work! That they may labor therein and let them not regard vain words. To him, it's just vain words. You wanting to go do something for the Lord. The devil is going to say, no, <laughs> I don't think so. Hey, boys, lay it on them. Put more burdens on them, more work, more life, more life. This is exactly what happens. And you know what? We as people, you know what we like? We like things in this world. Our flesh loves it. No matter how spiritual you are, you have to fight it. We like status. We like being up on that totem pole. We like money. We like reputation. We like uh, uh, popularity. We like to go have fun. And, you know, we we need time to rest and have fun and relaxation with our family. So don't think I'm going so far as you can't do any of that. But, you know what, I was even part of that. I had the nice trucks. I had the quads. We had, I mean, I went snowboarding all the time. We used to go out and, and do all these things. We had all these things. And uh, I coached all my kids in soccer. My wife started coaching. She was the president of the soccer board in our town. And, uh, man, we had, we were faithful in church still. We went to church and we were teaching and we were there for every single service. We had so much going on. That you know what happened when the call came is like, wow, how are we going to do this? The cares of this world, all the things going on. There's no way we can serve the Lord. with. We have too much. We had to start pruning back those thorns, clipping them. Just like briars do. They slowly creep in. You're like, ah, I'll get it later. It's okay. You come back a week later and it's six feet longer. <laughs> they creep in without you knowing it and they choke that word of God out of you. Come on now. That's what the cares of this life will do. And the devil is not going to be obvious about it. He's going to work on you in a way where you're not going to notice it. Go back to Luke chapter 8. Let's look at the last heart here. Back in Luke chapter 8, verse 15. Here's the ground that the Lord desires us to have. The heart He desires us to have. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. An honest and good heart 
that keeps the word that the Lord can stir up and motivate to do something for him. Preach to us. Amen. Many times we quench the spirit. I know you've done it. I've done it. I know it happens. The Lord starts speaking to your heart on an issue, and you're going, oh, no way. <laughs> you know what usually, you know what people usually stiffen up these days, what I see when I'm up here? When I start talking about TV, when I start talking about pushing worldly things out of their life. Trying to get the world out. People stiffen up. That's right. Yeah. He's trying to make me not have fun. I love that show. <laughs> hey, a good heart that holds that word and keeps it and doesn't let the world choke it. Be honest. Do you have a good heart? that will allow the Spirit to talk to it? Will it bring forth fruit with patience? To bring forth fruit, anybody who has fruit trees or a garden or anything, what do you got to do every year with any kind of fruit tree? You got to trim it, right? You got to start cutting back. With that garden, you have to pluck those weeds out of it. You have to weed it or it will die. Those weeds always overtake. The apple trees, they entangle themselves and kill themselves where they bear no fruit. Too much. We need to prune back, pick some weeds, keep it watered. Come on now. Keep it watered daily. Amen. And bring forth the fruit for the Lord with that good and honest heart. The question tonight, to end this up right here, what kind of heart do you have for the Lord? Where is your heart at right now for the Lord? I would pray that everybody in here would ask yourself, what kind of heart do I have for the Lord? Is it the rocky? Is it the wayside? The thorns? Or that good heart? That good soil that the Lord loves? Let's go ahead and uh, close our eyes, bow our heads. If we can get the piano to, to play. and I really want to open up a time for people to come to the Lord. And just ask yourself, what kind of heart do you have for the Lord?